This is the final video in a series of videos that is providing an overview of the Wells safeguarding procedures. This video in particular covers the process and responsibilities to be followed in relation to safeguarding allegations or concerns that are made about practitioners and those in a position of trust as it relates to concerns about both children and adults who may be at risk. Going hand in hand with this video is another video that provides you with an overview of the content of the procedures on the app itself. Section five details the process that should be followed when safeguarding allegations or concerns are made against practitioners and those in a position of trust. The purpose of section five of the procedures is threefold. Firstly, to safeguard both children and adults at risk from people who may pose a risk to them or who are not suitable to work with them. Secondly, to ensure that safeguarding allegations and concerns are dealt with in a fair, consistent and timely manner and follow statutory guidance and procedures. And finally, to ensure that there is appropriate support, information and advice for all those affected during the process. The content of section five of the procedures covers how to respond appropriately to safeguarding concerns about those whose work, either in a paid or voluntary capacity, brings them into contact with children or adults at risk, and about those who have caring responsibilities for children or adults in need of care and support, and their employment or voluntary work brings them into contact with children or adults at risk. It's important to understand how the remit of section five relates to the remits of section two to four in the same procedures. Section five, as we're now discussing, has a focus on the practitioner or the person of trust who is suspected of causing abuse or neglect. Whereas section two to four has a focus on the child or the adult at risk, who is either experiencing abuse or neglect or is at risk of abuse or neglect. Where appropriate, both sets of procedures must be followed in order to ensure the safety of either the child or the adult at risk. So when should we use the procedures? The first question to ask is, is the person in a position of trust? When we refer to a position of trust, the procedures state the following. Are they likely to have contact with children or adults at risk as part of their employment or voluntary work? Do they have a perceived position of trust, authority, power or influence over a child or an adult at risk? Are they expected to safeguard the interests of another person? If the answer to the question is no, then sections two to four of the procedures must be followed in relation to the child or adult at risk. If the answer is yes, the next question to consider is, is the concern regarding the behaviour that's harmed or may have harmed a child or adult at risk, a criminal offence against or impacting a child or adult at risk, or behaviour that indicates they are unsuitable to work with children and adults at risk in any capacity? If the answer is no, we will follow sections two to four of the procedures. If the answer is yes, then we will need to consider the next stages. But first, we need to consider, who do we inform? If somebody tells you about a professional concern, as with any disclosure of abuse, neglect or harm you receive, there are some do's and don'ts. Firstly, do listen and take it seriously. Keep an open mind, accept what they're telling you. Handle the allegation or concern in a fair, consistent and timely manner and follow statutory guidance and explain what you have to do next. Do not investigate or ask leading questions, make assumptions, interpretations or alternative explanations or promise confidentiality. So should you inform the person against whom the allegation is made about the concern that has been raised about them? The procedures state the following that when informing the individual, careful consideration should be given to the following things.
In terms of determining the timings, these will be determined in the next few steps that will be shared with you in relation to strategy discussions and meetings. You may also be wondering whether you should inform the child or adult at risk or their family or carer. Whilst the procedures do suggest that good practice would be to inform the individual, we must consider whether it is appropriate to do so. And it may not be appropriate to inform them if the discussion with the designated officer for safeguarding social services has not yet happened. The allegation made is against a family member or a police investigation could be hampered by doing so. So when do we make contact with social services? The person who has the concern or whom the allegation or concern is first reported must in accordance with the procedures record the concerns, any actions taken and any safeguarding action taken clearly highlights that this is a safeguarding allegation or concern in relation to a practitioner, volunteer or carer, and seek advice and support from the line manager. Immediately report the matter to the designated safeguarding person for those organisations who are not social services and the designated officer for safeguarding if you do work in social services. The designated officer for safeguarding in social services or the designated safeguarding person in other organisations will then need to consider whether the information they've been provided requires further action. If the answer to that is no, the rationale for this must be recorded. If there is some uncertainty, advice should be sought from the social services designated officer for safeguarding. If the answer to that is yes, there may be a requirement to address the issue internally, particularly if there's been poor professional practice, and there will be a requirement to make a report of possible professional abuse to social services designated officer for safeguarding. Social services will then convene a professional strategy discussion, which may include the designated officer for safeguarding, police, the employer, any other appropriate agency or partner. Within the procedures, there is detail as to who should be included in the professional strategy discussion. There will also be consideration given to whether sections two to four of the protection procedures need to be convened, started, commenced, and whether regulatory bodies such as those here need to be informed. The professional strategy discussion will then determine whether the allegation meets the threshold for progressing to a formal professional strategy meeting. If the answer to that is no, the rationale must be recorded. If the answer to that is yes, then a professional strategy meeting will be convened. The focus of the professional strategy discussion is clearly set out in the procedures as being the following. A consideration as to whether the matter needs the threshold for progressing to a formal professional strategy meeting. Are there any activities or caring responsibilities that need to be considered? Decisions about employer involvement. A review of the adequacy of safeguards that are in place, particularly for the child or adult at risk. Whether any immediate briefings to senior managers are required. Agree any actions to be taken or any further information needed prior to the professional strategy meeting. The main functions of the professional strategy meeting that are detailed in the procedures include the following. To ensure the proper coordination of child, adult protection, criminal and employment procedures. To share all relevant information about the allegation or concerning question to consider what action may be required to protect the child or adult at risk in question, to consider the likelihood of harm to other children or adults at risk with whom the person has contact at work or other activities, and to agree any actions that may be required, and to consider and evaluate the risk of harm to the subject's own children and agree any actions that are required. 
The functions of the strategy meeting also include discussions about any previous allegations or other concerns, to plan any inquiries that are needed and to allocate tasks and set timescales, to decide who is to be interviewed and who is to be the lead agency and identify the lead contact manager within agency, to decide what information can be shared with whom, when and who will do this and to agree timescales for actions and or dates for further meetings. It also includes consideration as to whether the adult suitability to continue working with children or adults at risk in his or her current position has been called into question, to ensure the proper coordination of child adult protection criminal and employment procedures, to share all relevant information about the allegation or concerned in question, to consider whether any disciplinary issues are to be followed up and to agree at what stage in the process the disciplinary issues should be followed up. And it should also consider any other factors that may affect the management of the case, confirm arrangements regarding who will communicate with the person about whom there are concerns and ensure appropriate support is provided to them, ensure that the appropriate referrals are made to the disclosure and barring service and registering bodies of the professional involved, and finally, the employer or voluntary organisation or registering body may need to consider suspending the employee without prejudice. It may be necessary, necessary to have more than one professional strategy meeting. However, there will be a concluding meeting that will be referred to as the professional strategy outcome meeting. The purpose of this meeting is to decide whether on the balance of probabilities, the concerns that have been raised are substantiated. The procedures set out what four decisions that that professional strategy outcome meeting could reach. The meeting will need to determine which of the four outcomes it will settle on. The four outcomes are that the concern raised is substantiated in that there is sufficient evidence to prove the allegation. It may be that the concern is unfounded. This means the person making the allegation misinterpreted the incident, was mistaken about what they saw, or was not aware of all of the circumstances. It could be that the concern is unsubstantiated. By this we mean there is insufficient evidence to prove or disprove the allegation. It could be that the concern was deliberately invented or malicious. And by this, we mean there is clear evidence to prove the allegation is entirely false and there has been a deliberate act to deceive. It will be on the basis of these outcomes that decisions will be made with regard to any criminal prosecution that may be required and any internal processes that will be required within the organisation that employs the individual who is the subject of concern. There will also be consideration given to any further safeguards that need to be put in place in relation to any adults or children who may be at risk. The procedures then conclude by stating that the outcomes discussion would normally precede any decision by the employer to invoke disciplinary procedures. Any disciplinary procedures invoked by an employer will be managed by that organisation. The procedures also state that where the concerns are substantiated, employing or volunteer agencies should consult if they haven't already done so with the disclosure and barring service and other relevant professional bodies about the requirement for a referral. So to conclude the procedures, it's worth considering the following quote from the National Independent Safeguarding Board for Wales, which states that no one should underestimate the challenge of both protecting children, young people and adults from harm, and in preventing such harm in all its forms and wherever it may occur. It is a challenge that professionals and organisations face daily, but if safeguarding is truly everybody's business, it is a challenge we should all face every day. This brings to an end, not just section five of the procedures, but the series of videos 
that together have provided some insight and an overview of the procedures as a collective document and process that must be followed.